All right, everybody. Well, welcome back to another episode of First and Null. Florida State still undefeated, back in the top 25. And how about it? Maybe the Nulls are back. Maybe they're not. But we're going to keep saying they're back each and every week until it's true. Uh, that's what we're doing on First and Null. Um, we've got an all-star cast going here for you this afternoon. And we appreciate your listenership on Apple Pods, on Spotify, on YouTube, and uh, it's been fun to see this thing grow as as we've kind of done this this year. But we've got Roberto Aguayo, as always, former Grozo Award winner. And we've got Mike Monaco of ESPN and ACC Network joining us here. He called the game this weekend between Florida State and Boston College. But you know Kurt Weiler well. Kurt, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, just Florida State, the, the way they've played, uh, we, we've talked about in the past, it's less about the opponent they face and the mentality of, trying to be better yourself and kind of facing the man in the mirror, so to speak, and, and trying to focus on the guys around you. It seemed like this weekend that was highlighted in the way that they performed against Boston College. I think that's absolutely true. I think that they could have easily looked at who they were playing, the state of that team, and uh, not not come out and kind of made the statement they did early in the game. I mean, the story I wrote immediately after that game when is the last time we saw Florida State do that uh, to in, to another ACC team? I mean, it's been a minute. It's probably not too long after uh, Roberto's career came to an end. I mean, it was uh, quite an impressive showing. All the caveats of of Boston College and state of that team aside, I mean, it's if Florida State talks a lot about kind of we're just focused on us, and that was a game that to me I think confirmed a lot of that. Roberto, you know, you and I chatted in the in the radio booth at one point about how it seemed a lot like when you played. You guys come out no mercy first quarter. You know, Jameis Winston's all over people, and uh, you've got about four or five extra points in, and then you go and rest for three quarters because the work has been done. Um, but but it, did you get that vibe? Not just the atmosphere of, of the weekend altogether, but the way the guys approach the game. Yeah, I mean, leading up, we knew what was gonna what was gonna happen. The the stadium that was sold out, uh, so that was already. I mean, even being there for the call uh, for the Osceola Friday night for College Town, the energy is different, uh, the vibes different, this team's different, and it reminds me of a lot a lot of like when I was when I was in school and the camaraderie they have. I was in the, I was in the training room, you know, Friday afternoon, Thursday. And, you know, I remember Coach Norvell walked into the training room, just what's up, everybody, like everyone good. And like just with big energy. And, you know, that just instills confidence. Uh, you know, he's confident in his team and going into the game, being down there pregame, the energy, you know, the way the players were were preparing. And obviously, like there's still that question mark, like they haven't done this since since I left school. And how are they going to respond from being three and zero and all the hype, everyone's talking about them. They had, oh, you know, they're projected to go to this bowl now. Like we're projected to beat, you know, Clemson by this much now. But when I was there, it was Coach Fisher. All right, the next, the next opponent. We're not worried about Clemson. We're not worried about NC State, Wake Forest. We got to beat this Boston College team because Boston College has always given us, you know, good fights. And you never know. We go in there not prepared, you know overconfident thinking, Oh, we're going to beat this Boston college team. They could have definitely put it to us, but you know, we went in there prepared. They played the same game. The opponent ha opponent had no face. We went in there, did what we had to do and ended up 44, 14. So. And Mike, you know, you've been preparing for Florida state all week and, and getting ready for your call. And then obviously Boston college, maybe not the most intimidating of opponents for, for FSU this season. They've, they're going through a lot of issues on the injury front themselves, but in the week leading up, to this, did you feel a different sense of confidence in the way FSU was approaching playing week to week? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, you know, like and Tim Hasselbeck, who I was working with uh, on the broadcast on Saturday, along with Kelsey Riggs, he made this point in our first production call of the week, uh, which just is a little behind the scenes inside baseball. Like for for that crew, that was on Tuesday. So gearing up for a Saturday game, it was on Tuesday. And he made the point right then and there that like, you win two games like the ones that Florida State had won most recently in the fashion you do LSU uh, and then Louisville like that that means something you know Mike Norvell says like yeah we haven't played our best game yet but still like you win games like that and I think that gives you a sense of confidence and I think that helps a team that 
you know, still early on in the year is, is finding its identity. Uh, and for a program that's trying to change the tune of, of the last, you know, however many years, like that goes a long way into establishing an identity in that sense. So, yeah, I mean, I just sensed it, you know, in, in my time, uh, getting ready for it and listening to, you know, press conferences and then talking with coaches and talking with players. And we went to practice on Friday, like, there was a great energy to what Roberto was just saying about Mike Norvell. Like he sprinted into practice on Friday at the beginning. Like he's almost in like a full sweat already. And I mean, you guys have probably seen plenty of that covering practice through the years, but like Kelsey Riggs looked at me and she's like, yeah, isn't it, isn't it awesome? Like the energy that he brings to a practice. Um, but then just the confidence too. And I'm sure we'll get into Jordan Travis, but we talked to him uh, after practice on Friday and we had known that, that he was going to start on Saturday. Um, the confidence that he has, like that really stood out to me as well. And I think when your quarterback sets the tone in terms of confidence that, that he carries with him and everything he's experienced in his career, I think that's a pretty big tone setter for, for a team and a program. I think that's a good segue into Jordan Travis, because uh, that was much of the story for the week. Um, and, and Mike, I know, you know, from, from calling games too, like when you hear news like that, you, you keep it to yourself, but for a lot of us, it was a, a big question mark. I think Kurt was at practice on Tuesday and Wednesday, and by Wednesday, Kurt felt like pretty confident that Jordan could give it a go. I know you wrote an article, Kurt, for the Osceola, um, saying that you know he looked pretty good for a guy that had to be helped off the field in Louisville. So um, I think that was big. Obviously, Tate Rodemaker, Kurt, the way he played, gave FSU confidence they could beat BC. Uh, but when you see... Travis running around, what were your initial thoughts, Kurt, on just the, the confidence, like Mike said, that he gives the rest of that roster? Yeah, I remember the what? The Sunday, that was the Friday game at Louisville, he gets hurt. And he sends out the tweet, I think, Sunday night of like, great news, guys. Just got some great news, something to that effect. And I remember thinking like, maybe it's only like a couple weeks. Like maybe, because originally you wonder if he was thinking in that moment when he got hurt, like this could be a long thing. I may be out for a while. Maybe my season's over. And maybe the news was, oh, it's only it's only a couple. I mean, he didn't do much Tuesday, and then he was pretty much a full participant Wednesday, and it was pretty uh, stunning to watch. I mean, he looked like himself on Wednesday. Even I mean, he had the knee brace on that he was wearing Saturday as well. People kind of uh, picked up on. We were told <laughs> below the knee in videos. People on Twitter were pretty uh, wise to that. But no, I mean, it was uh, it, it was impressive. And I mean, you talked about. It. I think. Tate could have absolutely won them the game, especially the Tate we saw in the second half of the Louisville game. But, I mean, there's a reason we all had Jordan Travis as the most important player on this team coming into the year. I mean, that's even, I think, before we have seen we saw for ourselves kind of the strides he's made this year, even from the end of last year. But, no, I mean, he's the heartbeat of this team. And so I, I think it meant a great deal that he was able to uh, work his way back. Berto, from your playing days, you know, obviously you played with some really good quarterbacks in your career and Jameis was really the the main one at the time. What's it like when the leader of your locker room is your quarterback, when the best player on the field is the quarterback as opposed to, to maybe a different position? The leader on the team. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing we talked about with how I felt like last year it was between uh, Mackenzie and, and Jordan, and there was no real leadership. Like who, who are we going to follow? Right. And now with that whole year he had and the whole team knowing like, this is our guy, this is our leader and he's developed. I mean, he, Jordan's been there since when my brother was there and, you know, my brother's been out of the, out of college for a couple of years now. And like, uh, I, I think it was Kelsey Riggs. that said it on the, on air where, he's been a slow developer at quarterback. He didn't start off his freshman year starting uh, at quarterback. He's, he's had some trials and tribulations. Oh, you know, I'm not the starter. Oh, McKenzie transfers McKenzie's, you know, from UCF, what, what he did there. So this is, has been his, has been his year to shine and be at the helm. And with all the experience he's had, he's a mature quarterback. He's poised. I mean, it reminds me of a lot. Like when Jameis was at quarterback, you want to, you want to have a poised quarterback, a confident quarterback, a guy that isn't going to, uh, um, you know, lose confidence when, you know, if he throws a pick or, or, you know, makes a bad uh, play. And you, sh- you see that, you know, with him on the field and that just gives confidence to the other guys. If they make a bad play, you know, they look to him, they always turn to him to see, okay, you know, are we good? All right, we're good. And then we keep moving. So they just got to keep that going. 
And if with Jordan Travis, he keeps that confidence going, it's only going to keep growing and growing and growing the rest of the season. Yeah, and I agree with that 100% because the way that Jordan, I think, has that calming effect on his team, it was something Norvell told us in the offseason. It was, this is the first time I've seen Jordan be intentional about trying to be a leader for the rest of the guys. It's the first time I've really seen him put his arm around a player who's not performing well in practice and seeing him go out of his way to try and be that leader because by nature, Jordan is is quiet and he's not a, a rah-rah guy. He doesn't really want to get up all in your face the way that that Jameis did. I mean, Jameis was the opposite of quiet and, and reserved. So that, that's that been big. I guess, Mike, you know, the, the ACC is known for really good quarterback play, and it has been for a couple seasons now. What's impressed you the most about Jordan and, and his development and his improvement? And in your opinion, where does he where does he stand amongst the ACC quarterbacks for this season? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't think it was that long into the game. I said the same thing to Tim, like, hey, how good is he? Like, on the air, like... I mean, he's playing at such a high level. And I mean, I didn't dive super deep into the post game comments, you know, once we got done with the game, but I think I saw Norvell said something about like, you know, he's, he's playing as good as any quarterback in the country. Right. And I think it'd be hard to argue with that. Um, yeah. I mean, he's playing at a really high level. Uh, we were talking with him at practice on Friday morning and Jordan said to us, like, he was like, oh, I was thinking about it the night last night. So Thursday night, he was like, I haven't even really run the ball like at all this year. And going into the game, he had 32 rushing yards. And so for as much talk as there's always about his legs, and um, that doesn't always just show itself in rushing yards, right? Like your ability to scramble and extend the play, like that has to do with your your ability with your legs, obviously, as well. But I think the fact that that so much of his success has been on, you know, just like in rhythm throws. That's what uh, coach Norvell was saying to us that like, you know, he's always been good with, you know, the on the move throws and, and off balance and on the run, but just sitting in the pocket, like on rhythm, on time, get it out quickly. Like, I mean, he, he was clinical with that. And um, in a game, I guess, where you had every reason to wonder about how that would look where his knee, you know, had been bothering him. He told us that his ankle, he had also felt that now, obviously that's what he grabbed that first uh, when he went down that Friday night against Louisville. So like you have every reason for uh, to, to not come out and be exactly precise with, with what you're doing with your throws. He came out and he did it. And yeah, you know, it, it wasn't the best team in the ACC. It was a, a Boston college team that's, that's dealt with a lot of injuries but their defense still came in. You look at like the efficiency numbers, still a top 50 defense in the country. And the injuries haven't exactly been, you know, heavy on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, like we started this by saying like Florida state just did what it is supposed to do, like in a game like that with all the hype. And I think that's evidence of the growth as well. But yeah, back to the question. I mean, he's, he's playing at a really high level and uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to, to put a lot of guys as far as ACC quarterbacks, maybe as good as him. Okay. Maybe, but right now through four games, I don't know who's playing better. Yeah. I think to the, uh, to the yeah, run stat you mentioned, Mike, I think he has 48 yards now. He had that one run was the only one he took off all night. I think he had 13 games in his career entering the season with more than 48 yards rushing. Yeah. And he now has 48 yards rushing. It's I mean, crazy. he, He's still out to it feels like he still feels like he has to prove something to people. Because like even if you look at his postgame tweet, he he put on the end of like the great game, he was hashtag I am a quarterback. <laughs> so like he I don't know if that's like just reminding people or what it is, but he uh, wanted to prove he was a pocket passer and he has definitely done that. Yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um I I, it was interesting talking to him too, and, and you guys know him better than me. You've you've talked with him far more than I have, but like I really was struck by the confidence. And that's a word that Mike Norvell kind of unprompted mentioned to us like three or four times in talking about Jordan. Like he just seems like he's in a really good headspace, like mentally with everything. And like I think the the prep work he, he talked about like committing to his film work. And I think he said it to you guys in fall camp. Um, like about going in to watch film at 10 or 11 PM with his dog. Sometimes like when you put in the, the prep work behind the scenes, I think that leads to confidence. Um, and I think his confidence is, is just, I mean, how could it be, be much higher? You know, when you have the, the work that goes into it, then the results as well. And it kind of only compounds from there. And, uh, yeah, sure. It does seem like he's, he's committed to, uh, to proving something and he's doing it so far. 
there was a throw guys that, that he made, I think it was in the first quarter. It might've been obviously Benson had that big moment to, to kind of set the tone of it for FSU, but there was like a fourth and nine, maybe that, that Jordan Travis hit Cam McDonald on a, yeah. on a seam route up the middle. And that was like the anticipation of the throw. He threw it before McDonald broke Florida state protected a blitz well and, and adjusted. He called out his protection then hit McDonald over the seam and it was like a 20 yard gain. And that could have been a big moment in the game where if BC gets a stop, they have some confidence in a one score game. And then Florida state scores up two touchdowns. And at that point it's over, but that's highlighted to me uh, multiple facets, right. Of, of Jordan Travis's improvement, pre-snap being able to throw with anticipation, having the confidence to do both. And, And that's not something you could have said about him, um, his entire career at Florida state, but I think Roberto nailed it earlier when it was, you know, last year it was, is McKenzie Milton the quarterback? Is Jordan Travis the quarterback? The effect that has on the locker room, but what about the effect it has on Jordan Travis and not knowing, you know, is this my team? Is it my locker room? Can I be that leader that, that I've always wanted to be maybe and grow in that aspect and having one voice I think is huge for FSU. So um, he's continuing to play at a really high level and, 300 yards plus um, big chunk plays galore. And we, again, like you said, Mike, we haven't seen him run the football yet. Like we know that we know when the game plan calls for it, like he's going to still be able to cause havoc with his legs. Um, I think we'll move on from Jordan and and just talk about Trey Benson for a second, because uh, that kid's a monster, not just on kickoff return where he, you know, bucks two or three guys and continues down the field, but his ability, um, with the football in his hands out of the backfield for any of the three of you, Florida state's known for having three guys that they like right now with, with Benson, Toa Feely and Ward. Do we see potentially a, a little bit of a care, a, you know, share of carries, so to speak, um, going to Benson's way here as, as the season goes forward. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think so. I think, I think a major benefit. I mean, I think when you look at him, we saw it, I would say, especially we saw it in the Louisville game where that was a close game into the closing minutes. I think you saw how fresh Trey Benson was. He was big in that fourth quarter of that game just because he'd only received a handful of a reasonable amount of carries. It's not like a, a B. John Robinson who kind of gets the, the major workload of the carries. I think there's, there is more benefit and each of them are good enough. It's not, you're not going to that depth of three headed monster because that's just what Mike Gravel wants. I think you're doing it because they've all proven to be worthy of carries. They all bring different things to the table and they can, they can also all do everything. I don't think it's like a, well, this is our third down back. Well, this is our guy who catches passes out of the backfield. I think they, they're all pretty well-rounded, but they also all bring different things to the table. So I, I'm not sure Benson might start getting more. You're right, but I don't know. I think I like them all. I, yeah. I like all the running backs. Like we, we were talking about it, get ready for the game. Uh, and like on our production call that I mentioned on Tuesday, Tim Hasbuck's kind of filling in our whole crew of like a scouting report on both teams. Like what jumps out to him, what he likes. Uh, he's already watched the film of, of both teams, you know, as of Tuesday. And he just kind of kept listing off Florida state skill guys that he likes. He's like, oh, I like this guy too. I, I, I like this guy too. Uh, there's a lot of that. And I think we've seen that with like a different receiver stepping up every game and leading the Knowles in whatever categories, but the same with the running backs. I mean, I love Trey Sean Ward. Like he is patient. He is shifty. Um, I think Toa Philly, like you see how much they value him by his third down usage a, a lot of times and that he's in there quite a bit. Um, but yeah, how can you not like Benson too? And, and Mike Norvell made this comment to us going into it when we chatted with him, I guess it would have been Thursday. He was like, every day you can tell he's getting better. And every day you can tell he's getting more confident. And he said to us, he's like, look, he's 215 pounds. He might be the fastest guy on our team. And then whatever, 13 seconds into the game that gets supported in both ways, you know, with the speed. And then with the fact that he's 215 pounds and Aria, like you said, like, he's running dudes over and he's finishing it with like my favorite part of the kick return touchdown was the stiff arm. Like he has every reason to have an empty gas tank and he is stiff arming that dude at the end, uh, into the end zone. So, uh, yeah, what a talent. And, you know, just looking at his post game comments, like seems like he's only getting more comfortable with the stage and the role and fitting into a new place and kind of the anxiety and the nerves that were there for Duquesne are, are long gone. It sounds like for Trey. Yeah, I mean to be to be six one two fifteen as a kick returner, you don't really see that 
that often it's usually the uh the the smaller wide receivers or you know a smaller uh a running back at returner but when you got a 215 pound back <laughs> that can run the way he runs i mean i was there when when you called it <laughs> the opening kickoff i mean and the thing is it's like he doesn't really look that fast running but he's fast he gets down yeah, the field yeah. and uh kind of reminds me of like uh like a carlos williams when i was when i was at school and like him as a Carlos Williams and a Treshawn Ward, kind of like a Devontae Freeman, more shifty, patient, you know, and, and Treshawn or uh, Trey Benson is more, you know, down the line, finds a hole, hits it. Um, and, you know, on a kickoff team, if you're watching the film, if you're Wake Forest, you're watching that film, you're like, man, this guy's a big dude and he's fast. Like, <laughs> and then, and then, and then on defense, you know, a big dude get, can run fast. And then you got Treshawn or uh, Treshawn Ward that comes in there shifty uh, it's just like too many, like, like uh, Tim Hasselbeck was saying in the booth, it's like one player, like we're naming off so many players that yeah. as a, as like, it's just so many people to guard that you didn't see that last year. Um, uh, Jordan Travis has these, all these wide receivers that he throws that can throw to now that they're all good. And the running backs like you, like, okay, when we can't pass it, we're going to run it. And having those options, I think spreads it out more. And it's just harder on defense to, to defend. This offense is starting to. Right? There's still more room for growth. The offensive line's without a few guys. I think that shows at times. I think, but this offense is starting to look like Mike Norvell's offenses did at Memphis. You're starting to see. I think it helps that he's calling plays this year too. I mean, I, not to say Kenny Dillingham was a liability. I don't think that's the case. But I think there's something to be said for instead of them kind of having maybe a back and forth dialogue, it's Norvell doing it. So I think I think you're starting to see what he built built at Memphis show up a little more here. And I think that's going to make guys that recruits more likely to maybe want to come be a part of it, seeing kind of the, uh, the proof of being in the pudding. Yeah. I mean, I think the toughness is definitely starting to show where maybe Florida state's not the most talented team on the football field week in and week out, but just like Norvell's teams at Memphis, you know, there's a grittiness and a commitment to the game plan and to each other that, that you saw with the Tigers when they were, you know, winning the AAC and, and battling UCF each and every year. But it's funny. Uh, I actually ran into Carlos Williams at, at a local coffee shop, sent Roberto uh, a selfie immediately and, and he was, you know, a guy who's 220 pounds and he was like, Benson is a bad man. Um, and, and he was talking about how we're really going to find out what Florida State has, you know, as the season comes along, because this three game stretch coming up for them where it's Wake Forest, NC State, Clemson, that's uh, you're going to find out like like how good is FSU? We're about to know. It's going to be known in these three weeks if the Knowles are a I think we've all kind of seen that FSU is going to be better than the Vegas odds projected. I think that's pretty clear to, to most people. Um, but is this a team that can win the Atlantic? I mean, we'll, we'll find out here in the next couple of weeks, but um, I, I guess Mike, from, from your researches uh, and, and your studies of, of the ACC this season, it seems wide open, right? Like Clemson's Clemson's still pretty good. Um, Wake's pretty good. NC state's pretty good. And then in the coastal trying to figure out in the coastal who's who's good I, I think Pitt looks looks solid but Miami doesn't look solid and, and by the way boys we're going to talk about Miami later in the show because I've got a lot <laughs> um, but I mean Mike what do you got I mean what have what have you been able to learn from even Hasselback and Riggs on the ACC yeah I mean huge huge three games coming up and that's going to be just a ton of fun from like a fan perspective of even all three of those matchups uh, starting this weekend. I mean, Wake, you know, like couldn't have been a whole lot more impressive in a loss than they were. Uh, you know, I'm sitting in the hotel getting ready for our game on Saturday. I'm, I'm just watching that game uh, and certainly felt like they they had every chance to win that game. Um, I think DJ Uyunglele is is – answering a ton of questions in his own right, like similar to what we talked about with Jordan. Um, you know, he, he was more accurate. He played better in the second half of last season. Uh, Uyung Lule, that is. And, you know, like our crew, um, so I was filling in on that crew for, for Dave O'Brien. They had just had Clemson. So, uh, two Saturdays ago now they had Louisiana tech Clemson and they, they talked at length about this. And this is what the Clemson coaching staff said to them. Like, 
there is no quarterback controversy with, with the freshman club, Nick, uh, who has come in. Like this is DJ being the quarterback. Like he is a changed guy from last year. Everyone's talked about how much he, you know, he lost 30 pounds or whatever it is. Uh, so he was, he was really impressive in that game as well. Um, so I mean, I like Wake. I like Clemson. Clemson has questions. I, I would say not just in the secondary, but defensively as well. Um, we saw what Sam Harbin did uh, against them. I mean, he kind of picked them apart. I really like NC State. Uh, I had their their spring game. Uh, Tim made this comment. Roberto was in the booth when, when he said it on the air Saturday. Like, I think NC State's flown a little bit under the radar. Um, and part of that has to do with with their schedule. And I think part of that has to do with Devin Leary not putting up maybe the gaudy statistics um, at least, you know, however much you can look into to four games now, but that's a really good team. And they brought back so much on defense. They've got pretty good wide receiver play as well. They feel like they had some breakout candidates at running back and Leary's really good. Um, so I think that team is, is pretty vicious as well. And obviously they've got a huge game this weekend and, and their ranking indicates, right. That, you know, how good they are, but yeah, I mean, I could go on about, about the Atlantic and the coastal. I mean, that's, yeah, that's another story. North Carolina, boy, they've had their struggles defensively. Uh, Duke, I mean, Hey, no shame in losing to Kansas. Like Jalen Daniels is for real. Some of the throws he made in that game uh, and Lance Leipold, like what a coach he is. Um, and then, yeah, to, to your point, Ari, on Miami, like we're, we're down on the field before the game on Saturday. And, uh, let's just say the, the Miami score had made its way to, to both coaching staffs. They were, they were aware of, of what was happening, uh, in, in that matchup with middle Tennessee. Hey, Miami still doesn't have any ACC losses. They're still O and O in the ACC. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Right there for them. Let's just say, uh, the, the score got on the scoreboard, the video board and Doug Campbell and, uh, 80,000 Seminole fans let uh, Middle Tennessee State know how they feel about them uh, on that one. Yeah. Mike, did you know, by the way, that Rick Stockstill is a former, is a Florida State graduate? <laughs> In his post game Zoom, he shouted out Florida State and said, I bet you Tallahassee's hyped because we went down there and kicked their tail. And I'm not afraid to say it. We kicked I, yeah, I, saw, I saw some other confident quotes from him, too. I, I like what he's selling post game, uh, just in terms of, of sheer confidence. Of course, I'm an ACC company man. I want to see the ACC teams do well, but uh, you, you got to love the fire like that post game. Yeah, what was it I like? His, uh, Go ahead, Kurt. I laughed at his comments today. I think he went on the radio. He was still going today. He went on the radio, and I think he said <laughs> they paid us $1.5 million, and they got 1.6 yards per carry. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> oh, awesome. my God. <laughs> well, you can add Middle Tennessee to the list of schools that have uh, been paid handsomely this season to take a win. Uh, Mike, I'm sorry about Notre Dame and – in the way that they've been <laughs> times this season, we won't we won't go there, but maybe we will later when we talk national. Um, I want all three of your perspectives on. We touched on it maybe a little bit earlier, but kind of let's go deeper into it. The environment around Tallahassee right now, Mike, you got a chance to call a game in a sold out Doke that had to be special. Roberto, you saw a sold out Doke for the first time in a while, like it was 2013 again. And Kurt, you've been covering basically the rise of the program to the fall of the program and maybe this little uptick back. So I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your takes on, on, on your experiences in, in Doak this weekend and, and what it means for Tallahassee going forward. And whichever, you, whichever one of you want to start, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, get, I didn't cover much of the rise. Already. I started on the beat in 2015. I kind of got in at the, uh, at the wrong time, <laughs> if, if we want to be honest. I missed the, uh, the back-to-back trips to the Rose Bowl. And uh, and then covered some other bowl games and other other than some seasons without bowl games. It's uh, it's something. I mean, this is the first time this this coaching staff, for the most part, outside of Odell Hagens and and Ron Dugans, have got to experience that. It's the first time, pretty much every player. I think it's the first time any player has experienced a on this roster has experienced a true sellout at Doak. And I mean, it was not the most intense crowd. I mean, I think I think it's possible we can get a more intense crowd than that for Clemson, depending on what time that is in a few weeks. I doubt this weekend, unfortunately, because of the circumstances, but maybe the Florida game too. I know that got announced as a sellout today. I mean, it just speaks to people can forget that where Doak belongs in that conversation when uh, when it gets rocking and what the community can be like. I think uh, 
Adam Fuller kind of talked yesterday about, you know, like I have people come up to me at my kids' baseball games. I have my wife, well, people come up to my wife when, when we're out, just like, I mean, I think they're, they're seeing kind of how special a place Tallahassee can be when the football program is rolling like this. And I think they definitely uh, appreciate it. Mike, you want it? Or you want me to go? You, you go, you go. I mean, it's, I was thinking about it the other day and I'm like, it's 2022. The last time we won a national championship was nine years ago. So it's coming around that time. Right. And the year, like the time before that was 99. So it's, you know, th- we set the standard and, you know, everything happened with coach Fisher and how, you know, he left. And then ever since, you know, then it just, the the program, you just saw it, you know, turn into a downward spiral and, you know, it's it, it sucked watching Florida State and just, you know, being clowned on, oh, like Florida State, oh, you're, you're not good. They're not good, whatever. But it just shows how much Florida State is just a presence in college football. And for them to be good is just good for the overall college football from the history with Coach Bobby Bowden and what he did and how he turned the turned the program around and you know, that era in the nineties of all these, you know, all-star players and really in the two thousands, that's what I looked up to. And that's why I became a Noel. And it was funny pre- down in pregame. I saw uh, uh, Javier Badia on the sideline and he came and shook my hand and he was like, you don't remember me. And I'm like, I remember your face, but I was like, I was like, I don't remember. And he's like, I'm, I'm Javier Badia. He's like, I met you when you were coming out. He was like, you were a little cocky, you know, kid like coming out. And it was in 2012. I was still redshirted. And he said, like, you came out, sh- you shook my hand and you kind of just like, we're on your way. And I was like, oh my gosh, dude, like, I'm so sorry. And he's like, don't worry. He was like, I was the same way when I was, when I was in college. <laughs> and he's like, and he, and, and I asked him the question of like, Hey man, I was, I was probably 10 years old when I saw you miss that kick against Miami back in the day when, when it was the wide left. And I tell him that story, you know, I told that story when I was at FSU and I still tell it, you know, when we play Miami is, you know, I remember that, that game and I, I cried and I had my FSU Jersey on all my friends. We were at a birthday party for uh, my little brother's friend and they were all Miami fans and they were just hooting and hollering just the rivalry, like growing up, that rivalry is always going to be there and just Florida state being good being, you know, a presence in college football is fun. And it's good to see that back because when people see Florida state, they're like, all right, you know, they, they, they deserve to be in the top 25, you know, all the time. And it's good to see that. And now we've cracked the top, we've cracked the top 25. We're 23. So I'm, I'm excited to where this program's going. Obviously, you know, the talk is there, the hype's there, but, you know, taking it week by week, but the 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 team looks good. I mean, in all aspects, I just I if we can just keep stacking, you know, stacking the bricks day by day, you don't know where it could go. And it's the same thing that I say about the 2013 year when I was there. There was no expectation to win the national championship. Like there wasn't like projection like, oh, Florida State projected to win the national championship. We had just come up, come off winning the Orange Bowl. And, you know, Jameis was starting that quarterback. EJ had left. And I was starting that kicker, Dustin Headley. We had a lot of good guys leave, but what they had built before led into that. And whether it's this year or, you know, a couple of years after, I think, you know, with the two recruits that we had commit this week, I mean, it's just going to keep rolling and, and winning takes care of everything. Yeah, I would add on a few things. Um, like college football is better when Florida State is really good. Like it just feels like it fits. Like that's how it should be. Right. I think that was might've even been Tim's first comment when we came on the air, um, that that's, that's kind of the, the way it is. I also think the ACC needs Florida state to, to be at that level. Um, it's good for everyone involved. Um, I would say a couple of other things that stand out. Yeah. Like the recruiting buzz is real. Like, you know, five-star wide receiver commits on Friday, like that made its way to us, you know, and I'm not like in the weeds on recruiting with every ACC team, but like, you can feel it when something like that happens. Um, we went out to dinner. The The Florida state administration was nice enough to take a bunch of us of ACC network and ESPN out to dinner Friday night. We went to table 23 and the place was packed, like absolutely packed. 
Uh, and so just like, you know, like that's how college football should be like an absolutely packed weekend. Uh, and then, you know, Saturday, obviously like that as well. Um, the only other time I've been to a football game, Ari, I was telling you this when I ran into you Saturday in the elevator, the only other time I've been to a, a Florida state football game was a game Roberto played in and won, uh, 2014 Notre Dame at Florida state. And I said this even going into doing the game down there this past weekend, like I have not seen a better college football atmosphere than that game. And a lot of that has to do with Florida state um, and the culture of the program and the, and the fans and stuff like that. I was, I was so excited to come back just because like hearing the war chant down there when I was a college student, like that has stuck with me and how cool that game was. Um, And I was standing on the goal line for the pass interference call, like taking a video of it for the student newspaper at Notre Dame. Like it was crazy. Um, So I was excited to, to be back and, uh, Like that's, you know, that's, that's what you think of with Florida state football. Um, And not to sit here and say like, everything's rosy, you know, they're going 12 and 0 this year. Like they have three huge games coming up and and Mike Norvell would be the first to say like the work isn't done. Um, But it's moments like this along the way. And like Roberto said it earlier, faceless opponent, like, all right, like it it really is a injury ravaged BC team. Like that's kind of what you should do. And Florida state kind of three minutes into the game had, had let it be known what was going to happen on Saturday. Question for you, Mike, uh, since you were at that 2014 game, was that a, a clean pick play or, or are you with Brian? <laughs> I was going to ask the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to put the cap on right now. We're, we're allowing you to take off the company hat. I want to hear it from the man who went to Notre Dame. How did you I'm, feel I'm, at the end of that I'm, game? I'll be honest. It's like, that is such a hard call to make. And oh, yeah. it's funny, like I, every analyst I work with, like cannot resist making a snide comment about like whether it's a pick or a rub. I'm not talking about that specific play. Like, uh, you know, I worked with a defensive coordinator in week one and he's like, oh, it's always a pick. And then I work with a quarterback, Tim Hasselbeck on Saturday. He's like, yeah, we call them rub routes. And it's like, you know, <laughs> you won't find a greater discrepancy. Um, I, gosh, I don't know, man. Like it was funny, though, in the aftermath, I remember sitting in the Tallahassee airport the next day like listening to Brian Kelly's he always would have a Sunday teleconference in addition to his Saturday post game availability and like hearing like the parsing of that. And like (laughs) we, uh, the stuff that happened in the South Bend media in the aftermath of that is hilarious. Like Zapruder film level breakdowns of like the pass interference from like, we, we have received like angles of, of this play that like previously we didn't know were public. And it's like, it, it was crazy the aftermath of that. <laughs> and I happened to be standing on the goal line, literally uh, shooting on my phone. And I tweeted it out from like our, you know, student newspaper sports account. And like, by the time I wrote up the elevator back to the press box, like someone had picked it up and the tweet had gone viral from like our little like student newspaper account. They're like, Oh, look at this angle. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, that's, that's like a cop out, but I, I really don't know. It's such a hard call. Corey Robinson, right. I think is, is who it yeah. was. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was, uh, that was nuts. Like that was the coolest college football atmosphere. Uh, not, nothing better than that. At least you must have the funniest part of that is, uh, ever Golson's the quarterback there. And then the next year he's playing right. for Florida state. Yeah. Right. Right. Like he deals with that heartbreaking loss and he's like, Oh, they'll play there. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think everybody's eyes just like popped out of their heads when, when that ball was caught initially. Cause it was like the winning streaks over. Like, you're like, Oh yeah. my gosh, Notre Dame did it. Berto, you were on the sideline. I think your initial reaction must've just been like, yeah, oh, shit, we lost. <laughs> that was a, that was a scary sight for sure. We we're like, honestly, you didn't know how to react. You were just like, Oh shoot. Like <laughs> damn, we lost. And then all you see is the flag on the field and you're like, yes. yes. <laughs> Oh, I think it was again. I think I remember it was against Darby, the pick play. And uh, yeah, and Jimbo went crazy, like, oh, that's a pick, that's a pick. And then, you know, and I remember, I remember earlier in the game, I think Notre Dame had run it to success with one of their touchdowns, and Jimbo was chewing out the side judge. Yeah. And it was like one of those where Jimbo made it clear in like the second quarter. And so when it happened again, it was like everyone on the FSU sideline freaked out. (laughs) <laughs> you almost wonder if they didn't run it earlier in the game if like they would have let it you know ride 
Oops. it's a judgment call, right? Like we've yeah, seen, it is. It's we've seen it in football call. since then, how many times a rub route just is allowed to go. And, and I, I didn't think the ref would throw it in that moment. Like you don't want to be right. there and a game is decided, but wow, the, the winning streak kept going. Uh, alive. A moment. <laughs> Crazy, right guys. But uh, Kurt, uh, Wake Forest, they present a big challenge. Sam Hartman, we didn't know if he would even be able to be healthy enough to play. I, I want to say, I think we're all grateful that he's okay and, and that he's healthy enough to be able to give this thing a go. But um, what have you seen from this Wake Forest team that seems to be an offensive juggernaut under Dave Clawson once again? I mean, that offense is something else. It's funny talking to FSU's coaches with the slow mesh where they sit there for what feels like an eternity and kind of wait for the defense to commit to something before deciding what they're going to do. It's almost like a game of chicken. I, it's I, it's unlike anything really in college football. Like you talk to Mike Rivelli, you talk to Adam Fuller, they say like no one else really runs this. And I mean, it's a, I think when they started there, it's a smart move, especially because it's kind of a talent equalizer when you're going against more talented teams as Wake Forest, especially when they got there, was kind of doing it on a weekly basis. But they've uh, they've gotten a little better athletes now. They're still, I would say, not one of the better recruiters in the ACC by, by any means are probably never going to be just realistically, but no, I mean, they've, uh, they've gotten some great athletes to go there. I mean, that wide receiver room, it's, it is Florida state S where they have a few guys who any given week can, uh, can go off. And uh, it's uh, it will be a real test. I think it'll be the biggest test of the season for, for the secondary. When you combine the, the quarterback with Hartman's experience and that wide receiver room. Uh, yeah, I mean they run that that slow mesh offense that that really puts pressure on linebackers and and makes sure that they're. I mean it's a it's like a overmodulated RPO system in in some ways and no wake doesn't try to run the ball too much but they'll try and do it enough to make you stay honest and Sam Hartman you know Mike we talked about how good of a quarterback he is and and in this group of ACC QBs that that are so talented. Uh, he has a chance, I think, to, to give Wake a, a, a real possibility of winning the Atlantic this year. I mean, obviously, this is big for them as well, coming into Tallahassee after that loss. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely is. Uh, you don't want to start out 0-2 if you're them. And, uh, you know, you drop one at home, even if it's Clemson, go on the road. I mean, shoot. <laughs> maybe, you know, weather-wise, it, it's maybe not as an atmosphere like it totally would be like uh, otherwise, but Still, it's a game on ABC. It'll be a big scene there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he he gives them a, a great chance, not just Saturday, but um, but over the course of the season as well. I mean, I, I like Florida State's defense, um, and, and I like their secondary. I think uh, Robinson's playing at a really high level. Um, I keep watching film, like, I'm no, you know, film guru breaking stuff down. But, like, Bernardo Green, like, I, I couldn't get enough watching him on film. Like, that dude is such a sure-handed tackler. Um, feels like he's playing at a high level. Uh, but, yeah, like, you know, what, what you were saying, Kurt, about the wide receivers that Wake has, um, I think it's going to be a great game. I, hope you I like mean, points. yeah. I mean, I – I'm looking at something here. Top 20 that Wake Forest is top 20 nationally in scoring offense, red zone offense, passing offense, passing touchdowns, passing efficiency and yards per completion. <laughs> Pretty good. They're, yeah, they're good. Their offense is good, at least. And you know what I'm saying, and one of those was against Clemson last week. You know, they put up 45 points against it was a, a Clemson was a little depleted in the secondary, but still, I mean, it was a, it was impressive for the, by them. Yeah, so it's going to be a high-scoring game for sure. I mean, it's going to be a first test to our defense, and but our defense looks good. Deloach looked good on Saturday. Um, you know, like Mike was saying, you know, those guys look good back in the secondary. So, but I know they're getting ready. They're they're confident with these. You know, four wins. They're confident. They know what they have to do. Obviously, Norvell has them prepared, and you know, this Wake Forest team is going to come in you know, ready to play. They almost beat Clemson, a top five team in the country. I mean, it could have went either way with double overtime, but it's going to be one of the top games to watch this, this, this Saturday for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, they're going to take shots on Florida State's defense. They, they want to win one-on-ones and uh, they're not afraid to sling it with Hartman at quarterback, who I think might be the most underrated quarterback in the ACC. I think a lot of people, 
they're quick to mention uh, four or five different names. And then you go, Oh yeah, Sam Hartman's pretty good too. <laughs> um, and so this feels to me, Roberto, I'm going to bring it back to you because you mentioned that that 2013 season when we beat Clemson, right. And that was like the, the kind of the kicking the door down moment for FSU. But the week before they, you know, you guys beat Maryland who was a top 25 team at the time. And I think you beat Maryland like 63 to nothing or something like that, where it was like, that it was like, we think we're pretty good, right? Like yeah. he, that's, that's why I'm correlating it to right now. We're at this point where it's like, I think they're pretty good. This is yeah. a decent team. And then they beat Maryland that week, 63, nothing. And Jameis throws six touchdowns or whatever it was. Yeah. Had that play where he had like the Houdini act spun yeah. out two sacks to his right and threw a dime to O'Leary in the right corner of the yeah. end. Zone. And that was the moment people were like, okay, y'all like Florida States, Florida States better than, than okay. Like, and uh, yeah, I feel like this game was kind of like almost that same game where I remember when I was in the radio booth with you and I was like, dude, we could draw 50 on these guys. <laughs> like if we keep it rolling, I mean, we ended up putting Duffy in at the end. So, you know, we, we didn't keep uh, Travis in there the whole game. We put Rodemaker in. So I understand, you know, we don't, we don't need to, you know, score, you know, get the younger players in, get them reps, get them uh, the fe- what the feel is of a, of a sold out crowd, a night game. Um, because eventually those are going to be the the future guys, you know, after this year and years to come. So, but this could be kind of like that Clemson game back in that 2013 year where we can make a statement, you know, what if we go in and just, you know, play lights out, shut them down. They can't, I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking early, but this could be a, a, a game where if we win by two touchdowns or more like that, that's a statement I think for all of college football. Sorry, it's muted. Sorry, it's muted. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> Zoom in 2022 y'all. So, <laughs> Blame Aaron judge having a bat and still not in home run number 61. <laughs> Uh, the way it continues. How's the Maris? How's the Maris family doing? Are they bored? They've only shot to him about twenty-five times on this broadcast. So yeah, <laughs> they, they're tired of going to every game. <laughs> There's not a football game for them to cut over to tonight. Is someone going to like buy a team <laughs> record for passing yards they can cut to? Let's see if it happens. No comment. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, we're going to get to baseball here in about two minutes because I do want to hear you <laughs> the MLB season. Uh, but, Kurt, last thing, uh, we'll go to you on, on Florida State Wake. Is this the opportunity for FSU to kind of stamp their arrival back in the ACC race and, and kind of make that statement and say, hey, uh, you need to start taking us seriously as, as not just having a good season, but maybe having a great season? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's even just this weekend, but I think it's the next three games. I mean, I think you look at – the ACC Atlantic race won't be wrapped up in the next three weeks, but it seems clear like who will be the, who is the front runner will emerge. I mean, just if Clemson, which beat Wake, beats NC State this weekend, and then in two weeks beats beats Florida State, I mean, it's theirs for the take. They'd have to lose twice probably to to lose the division. So chances are they'll kind of reclaim it after losing it last year. NC State, I know. I mean, they'll have that chance this weekend. I Mike Gravel could be a We'll see like how the next three weeks go. I mean, now is kind of a – he has raised expectations to the point where I think coming into the year, when you looked at these three, definitely the toughest stretch of the season, you were like – most Florida State fans probably would have said, you know, if we win one of those three games, we'll be happy. And I think with the success that they've had now, people would only be, almost be disappointed if they only win one of the three. And you don't have to kind of look back at the at the preseason and say, you know, but like this was already maybe a bit ahead of schedule. But, yeah, no, I mean, if they win two of the three – I mean, they, they will be right there in the ACC where they'll be past, I mean, the toughest part of their ACC schedule with only one ACC loss. Yeah, so you got Florida State and you got Wake Forest, 3.30 on Saturday. It looks like Hurricane Ian's going to miss Tallahassee and uh, allow for this game to be able to be played without really any hiccups. But still keep keep an eye on that. You know, the Osceola will have you covered uh, all week long. Kurt's been doing a great job of, of trying to update everybody on whether – you know, this game can happen, how it will happen and how you can get to the game safely and be able to watch the Seminoles. So we are thinking all of you um, in, in South Florida right now, and especially Tampa area and the Naples area as well, uh, Fort Myers, because uh, that, that thing's coming in pretty hot. And so uh, stay safe, uh, make sure you're ready for it. And, and uh, we're all thinking about you. But um, before we talk about so, some major league baseball, um, since we do have Mike here, any thoughts on the national scene for college football? 
Uh, other than Miami, clearly does not look the part right now under Mario Cristobal. Is there any other storylines that have stood out to you guys? Is Mike frozen? Don't all jump at once, everyone. Yeah, nobody, nobody. All right, so nobody <laughs> watches all the scores. Oh, I thought I thought it was for Mike. I thought the question was for no, Mike. No, it's not for anything. Oh, hey, for everyone? Oh, okay. We can rip Miami for 10 minutes if you want. I have no issues with that. Uh, let's start with Tyler Van Dyke hasn't gotten the job done, and they replaced him in the middle of that game with Jake Garcia, who I thought for a while is the better player. He's the, the more talented player, and – Maybe he fits Gaddis's offense just a little bit more than, than Van Dyke, who I thought did well under Lashley. But but obviously, you know, Rhett Lashley has moved on. So the Hurricanes have really struggled. Was that an eye-opening score for, for all of you? Uh, Kurt, I guess we'll start with you and just kind of go down the line. Yeah, I mean, anytime you're losing at home by multiple scores as a 26-point underdog, it's a pretty eye-opening. The whole Tyler Van Dyke thing – I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I, he has not blown me away by any means. He definitely is missing. I think the guys he relied on last year, especially Charleston Rambo, but he's also without his two top receivers right now. So, I mean, I think it's kind of a matter of no matter who you put there, there are going to be some, some major problems. I mean, I think that's almost like if you, if you look at last year's Florida state receiving core, and if they were without Ontario Wilson and, like Andrew Parchment, you know, like that's like you're losing a lot of your upside and you're kind of left with uh, a pretty bare bones group. But no, I mean, it's a uh, it's funny. The, the the Miami fan pivot has definitely started a bit from like, oh, Mario's here. The U is back to, well, this is still Manny's team. He's having to build it back. And it's definitely a, the the tune has has changed a little bit because that was I mean, it was a that's an embarrassing loss. I don't, I don't care how many. uh fans you're playing in front of that was quite a quite a loss for them to take i think uh, the uh, the sequence of the failed fourth down and goal play to a 99 yard touchdown pass they allowed is stunning like it's a stunning sequence you know who uh you know who's really impressed me is the the tennessee volunteers i mean you haven't seen them shoot in the top 25 as opposed to even contending in the sec these past couple of years and they're four and oh and i know college game day was there on saturday and those fans are excited they're 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 ecstatic that tennessee's um back in it and it's been a long time coming for that program to turn around and um it's good to see them uh you know they're they're number eight in the country right now so i mean they're they're on the 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 hard side of uh, of the SEC, I forget what side it is, but with Bama and them. So even if they keep winning, like they got to beat Bama, but still it's good to see Tennessee, you know, making some noise in the SEC. Yeah. I mean, how about Brandon Hooker? Like how good he's been. Uh, he's awesome. Uh, yeah. They, they've jumped out to me too, Roberto. And I, I would say on the topic of, of transfer quarterbacks, this one's, uh, I guess maybe a little bit away from like the, total national spotlight, but Kansas state, Adrian Martinez, I don't know if you guys saw, like they won in, in Norman. Uh, and now they're ranked they're in the top 25 too. And like Adrian Martinez, who had, you know, a completely up and down college career as well. in his time in Nebraska, like he had some big, big moments, uh, in a win at Oklahoma. And he's like taking a bow literally, taking a bow, like after in celebration at the end of one of those games. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. Like by all accounts, he has said and done all the right things um, in some trying times over the course of his career. Um, so that was pretty cool to watch over the weekend. And uh, Deuce Vaughn, like that, that dude is electric. He is so small for a running back, Kansas state's running back, but he is so shifty and like watching him just juke is, is sick to watch. Um, so th that's the team I would point to as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's some good games this weekend. I like Minnesota too. Um, I covered PJ Fleck when, when he was at, at, um, at Western Michigan and uh, it, he just, you know, keeps, keeps building there and uh, someone's going to have to win the, the West of, uh, of the big 10. But uh, yeah, that's a couple national things that jump out to me. 
I think the the luster's kind of fallen off of Texas a little bit. That people were patting them on the back for you know maybe they should have yeah, beat Alabama yeah. if some things go their way. But you know you lose to Texas Tech now, and I know they're injury riddled a little bit going forward. But B. John Robinson obviously phenomenal. Uh, the Big Twelve seems open, and that's that's kind of fun to see who's going to take that in the Big Ten. Is it Ohio State and everyone else? Is that still is Michigan pretty good? I, I think we're going to have some answers here soon, right, Mike? I think until proven otherwise, it's Ohio State. Like their talent level is just at a different level, I think. Um, so until proven otherwise, like there's just a there's a gap in college football. Like I went to Notre Dame. I, I don't consider myself like a Notre Dame football fan necessarily. But like you're in media, you're kind of removed from it. But I hear it all through like all my college friends. And like for all of Notre Dame's success in the last however many years, like you're still trying to close the gap as a program with Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, and Clemson. Like that is the tier of the elite of the elite in college football. Um, so yeah, Ohio State and it, the talent they have, like the ridiculous number of first round, first round wide receivers, they seem to have an endless supply. Um, until, until someone takes that from them, um, consistently, not just, you know, winning game here or there. Uh, yeah, I think it's, you, you got to peg them as the favorites. You, do you like Freeman at Notre Dame, Mike? Have you seen, what have you seen from him? Obviously they, they've had a rough start a little bit. Um, the performance at Ohio state was pretty good. People were really excited. And then obviously what happened, um, in the couple weeks after that kind of have kind of been tough, but maybe North Carolina was a step in the right direction with the way they played. Yeah. You know, um, I think you saying it was a, a little bit of a rough start that, that uh, might not be the tenor on the Notre Dame message boards of, uh, of the fans of the program there. Yeah. I mean, it, crazy, right. You, you lose to Marshall uh, in week two coming off that Ohio state game, if you're Notre Dame and really in, in Brian Kelly's like second act as the Notre Dame head coach, if you, if you want to call it like Brian Kelly, 2.0 kind of reinvented himself after a four and eight 2016 season. Um, he didn't lose games like that. Like he, he, I think he literally won 42 in a row against like, um, unranked FBS teams or whatever it was. But, uh, I, I, th I think Marcus Freeman was a great hire. I think he's a really impressive coach and human being by all accounts. I haven't personally spent uh, time around him, but um, yeah, I think it's a great hire, but you know, it's he, he's, they've got work to do and they weren't helped out by losing their quarterback in the second game of the season either. Um, but yeah, it's a little shaky, shaky start and uh, I'm sure he'll get it figured out. Roberto, is it uh, Alabama? Is it Georgia and everybody else? Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, and then a clear tier below. Can anyone beat Georgia? They didn't play great this weekend against Kent State, I don't think. But like Georgia's looked like when they're locked in, it's like a completely different level than everybody else. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing we saw with uh, Texas and Alabama. Like, oh, they didn't look good, and uh, you know, Texas might win, but in the end, they end up winning. You know. And that's how championship teams, I think we talked about it already. They, they find a way to win at the end. And yeah, they might've went in that game like, Oh, you know, it's Texas. They're not good. You know, and it's sometimes hard to keep that same level uh, uh, week in and week out when you're that good. And you, sometimes you just want to be like, all right, we're going to take it, you know, a little bit easy on, on a team that we're expected to win. And then you get in there and you get close you're tied or close at halftime there. It's, then it's like, all right, we actually got to show up and play now because we got to win and we got to keep this streak going. So I think Georgia, Alabama. Yeah. I mean, even Ohio state, um, I don't think Clemson's really, you know, that, I mean, they've had some shaky wins, Michigan. I haven't really watched them, but you know, who have they really played? I, I don't know. I mean, it's always Georgia, Alabama, and, you know, maybe Ohio State. So we'll see who sneaks in there. And it's still early in the season. So we'll see. If I could chime in real quick on Georgia. Uh, I don't know if you guys have watched much of them, but their tight end, Brock Bowers, is, is like a freak, you know, all, all everything, right? Um, they're giving him like jet sweeps now. And he's just flat out out racing dudes. It, it's crazy. Like this is their tight end. And they're finding new ways to get him the ball. Um, I mean, the two best tight ends in the country are him and Michael Mayer at Notre Dame. And Notre Dame's not getting Michael Mayer the ball that way. 
and it, it just stands out like in such a stark um like contrast to like how you think of tight end usage uh <laughs> this dude this dude is a monster for georgia they're uh too deep their backups are better than most people's starters like that <laughs> yeah that's like what's crazy is they could they could honestly beat like 80 percent of college football playing the second guys and they're too deep and that's just a testament to what kirby's done and when Nick Saban says you kicked our ass in the fourth quarter, like in a national championship game, you just kicked our ass. Like, what does that say about where your program is that you yeah. can do that to a Saban roster ever? And so, I mean, yeah, I think right now it's George and everybody else. And the SEC has got some fun coming, you know, like Kentucky's pretty good. I think people are sleeping yeah. on Kentucky a little bit and former Florida state D coordinator, Mark Stoops, they, they've got a big matchup at Ole Miss and they're taking on the lane train, so to speak. And, uh, and then you got some some big ones in the ACC. We NC State Clemson could determine um, what happens in the Atlantic just a little bit, and um, we'll find out, right? Like Okie State Baylor could be a lot of fun too. Bama and Arkansas, like that's going to be fun in Fayetteville this weekend, where I think Sam Pittman's group is excited to have that opportunity, especially after the tough the tough loss to Texas A and M. But college football is going to be fun, and I think if we've learned anything is what we know in Week Four typically doesn't matter when it comes to like week 12 of the season uh, yeah. things change. And so um, do you want to pivot real quick, uh, Mike, while we got you to some baseball, I'm a huge Braves fan. Kurt's a huge Braves wow. fan. Um, who was your team? I guess before we get into it growing up, was there a, was there an MLB team? I know you're, you're uh, a new Englander. So uh, do you, are you a Red, were you a Red Sox by, by trade? Yes. Yep. Yep. Grew up a big Red Sox fan, uh, had the Nomar batting gloves, didn't emulate his uh, crazy pre-pitch routine, like redoing his batting gloves and tapping his toes in the box. Um, but loved Nomar growing up, loved Mo Vaughn. Um, then when I was a little older, Dustin Pedroia, obviously, how could you not love a guy that played the game of baseball or really any sport the way he did. Um, so yeah, big Red Sox fan growing up. So what's that like to get to call games for them on Nesson? I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. congratulations. That's been cool to watch. You get to do those. I, I'll pop on like the MLB TV app and I'm like, Oh, there's Monaco. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's that like to call your childhood team. It's really cool. Actually, it just popped up on my phone, you know, like the anniversary reminders or like years ago, this day popped up three years ago today as we sit here and record this was the first time I called the Red Sox game. And I was wow. so nervous walking into the booth that day. Uh, you know, like I had only called minor league baseball to that point and never called a major league game of any kind before. Uh, had barely even been in like a major league booth. Uh, so yeah, needless to say it was a nerve wracking, but B insanely cool. Um, and then with ESPN, the last couple of years have been able to, um, call a little bit more around major league baseball. Um, I've had the Braves a few times, a couple of times last year, once this year. Um, so that was pretty cool to kind of see them at the end of the season of the regular season last year, and then sit back as a fan and, and obviously watch what they did in the postseason, and then see them again this summer. Uh, I worked a game in July where I had them. Um, so yeah, it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the the baseball postseason. I mean, this is a really fun time of the year too, um, where you get like NBA and NHL right about to start. You know, we're now we're into college football, we're into the NFL, and baseball has the postseason. It's a good time. This is fun for fans. Kurt, uh, the Braves are up seven to two. The Mets are down six to three. And uh, we might have a tie in the NL East <laughs> as we head closer and closer to Atlanta. We joked, Mike, that Kurt and I were like, if they cancel Florida State away, we're heading to it to true <laughs> this weekend to be able to catch that series. So we weren't rooting. Obviously, we're not rooting for natural disasters, but we were making contingency plans. Uh, in case that that's the way that it went. Um, Kurt, thoughts on the baseball season for the Braves so far and, and that race with the Mets? It, it feels like the Mets are Metsing and the Braves are uh, showing the heart of a champion. I'm not biased at all. We'll see because I think what the Braves took a half game lead or tied it and quickly lost it. Like they've never really fully gotten over the hump and like stayed over the hump. So I don't know. I mean, it's one of those, it's like last year with that Dodgers Giants race. One of those teams is going to be a lot more deserving than like the the spot they get in kind of the uh yeah. the postseason seating. They're really good. The funny thing is you talked about uh heading up there. I think that they're gonna end up with more rain and weather than we are we are here in Tallahassee. I think it looks like it's gonna go across and then swing back up and maybe uh 
affect them up there some for that that weekend series i know the we'll see if they end up having to move it up or what they try and do to get around the weather because that might be a problem up there this weekend for a huge series huge series and i think the mets have uh bassett scherzer and Degrom going um so they've been preparing for this and i think that's what we asked for right kurt was like when they were down seven games or eight games after that you know after that that series in august it was like just get it back to atlanta with a chance like that's all you can ask for is is for that head to head series to matter some way somehow and it looks very clear like that's going to matter um for this division race but that being said and it could be for any of the three of you Roberto feel free to chime in as much MLB knowledge as you have if you've been, been watching this season but uh for 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 Mike and Kurt or, or Roberto uh is anybody better than the Dodgers or the Astros <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll just interject real quick. Are we gonna are we gonna do baseball talk without talking about Link Jarrett? He's gonna win a national championship somewhere. We can talk college been, baseball. I, and I, 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 that <laughs> would take. We would be on here for two hours if, if we <laughs> had another He's got a whole podcast. Yeah, Link Jarrett. Welcome Link to Jarrett, man. That is you baseball. can't make you can't make a better hire than that. So I don't know if anyone's beating the Dodgers uh, or the Astros. Those are those are definitely the favorites. The Yankees have scuffled in the second half. Uh, but Lake Jarrett home run hire. I mean, he, he came pretty close to winning a title at Notre Dame, which you uh, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't think was possible. It's one of those places they even get that close. pretty remarkably impressive. Yeah. And uh, I think you know, Florida state definitely hit the home run there, but, but yeah, I mean, guys, uh, is there anybody, Kurt, do you think there's anybody that could beat the Dodgers or, or the Astros right now? I was having a conversation with a buddy that, the Astros just kind of seem like this might be their year. Um, pitching depth, the lineup's pretty good. Um, they're playing with a chip on their shoulder. C- could that be the team of destiny, I guess, of this season? I mean, you you could have had the exact same conversation last year. Those were probably the two best teams in the regular season at this point last year. And then the Braves win the NLCS on the road against the Dodgers and, and the away team win the World Series. So, I mean, those are probably the two best bets, but I'm not sure I'm betting against, even if the Mets don't win the division. I mean, anytime you can trot out Scherzer and DeGrom when like kind of the pitching rotation shrinks in the postseason, it's, uh, I mean, that that's a team. Obviously, the Braves, I think, are right there. This is, I mean, about to be the first 100-win Braves team in a minute, potentially. And uh, so I think there's there there's some there's some interesting ones in there. I, I I've been hoping just like as a like wanting a t- a new face in there. I was hoping the Bra- the Orioles would sneak in, but I'm not. I'm sure they might. I think they might end up getting left out on the outside. Yeah, I saw the Orioles a couple weekends ago. Uh, <laughs> the, the future is really bright for them. Yeah, uh, between Rutschman and this guy Gunnar Henderson who was like by some accounts, the number one prospect in the game when he got called up, if they can just, and and they have homegrown pitching coming, but if they can find a little more veteran pitching this off season, uh, that, I mean, that division, you want to talk about the SEC East or whatever, but, uh, AL East is, is only getting scarier. No, I mean, it really is. And what three and a half games back right now, Baltimore is of Seattle. So that might be asking for a little bit too much at this point, but they've they've had something to cheer about at Camden for the first time in a while, and I'm keeping an eye on you know Phillies and and Brewers and Giants because well really it's just the Phillies and the, and the Brewers at this point, but that could be a lot of fun to see who kind of battles in and, and the Padres can they hold on to to that game and a half lead uh, the 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 NL wild card race is pretty fun as we get to the final few games of the year. Yeah, I mean, what three team three games separating those those three teams, and only two of them can get in. The Phillies clinging to that that spot right now, but I don't know. I mean, you talked about the Mariners. It's it, it, it's unfortunate. I guess only one of the Mariners or Orioles are gonna be able to get in because the Mariners is another one of like a real deserving fan base and a real fun team. I don't I don't watch a ton of non Braves baseball. I'll be honest, especially once football season kicks off. But I know that's another uh, exciting team for the future. Yeah, and it should be interesting to keep the tabs on that. We're, we're only a couple weeks away from from October baseball, and really, what a couple weeks? We're we're a couple days away from uh, about a week. Yeah, yeah, a, a week. And so, um, quickly, Berto, uh, are we buying stock in the Dolphins? Is it time? Is it time to to accept that the Dolphins are good? I, I want to believe. I don't know. I we've been hurt before. I don't know. 
I mean, yeah. Is it the right time to jump on the train? <laughs> That's the buzz down here in South Florida uh, with the win against the Bills. Shoot. Uh, there, there for a minute, I thought uh, Tua was out the way he <laughs> was wobbling on the field. Um, but he stayed in. They ended up beating. You saw Ken Dorsey <laughs> freaking out up in the yeah. booth. <laughs> I mean, when it ain't going your way, it ain't going your way. But, I mean, it's almost <laughs> – I mean – I th- I think you do. I mean, they're, they're playing well. They got they got um, Cheetah, they got Tua. That's been playing well. Everyone everyone just seems to hate on him. They don't they don't really like, you know, trust in him. But he's been showing, you know, good quarterback play. So, I mean, they beat my they beat the Patriots. Like, I think you hop on the train now. I mean, the, the Miami hasn't been good in a while. So shoot, might as well hop on it now. Tua wobbles once a week, man. Like that's that's like <laughs> until he gets stretchered off or carted off once a week. Oh man, and then he's back, and you're like, oh okay. That was quite a back injury. He was he was dealing with. Uh, Kurt, your Falcons big win, twenty seven twenty three. That's uh, hey, how about the heart that they're showing there? Um, that's that's something I I didn't expect it. I, I got to tell you, I got to say, I mean, uh, somewhat close to being three and out. I mean, for a one and two team, like they almost came back and beat the Rams. They uh, blew a lead. They had no business losing that game to the Saints back in week one. I mean, the problem is I don't think I really want them to be good this year. Like, you know, like it's not a team that's going to make noise. I'd almost rather them just go fully in the tank and be in contention maybe for one of the top few picks in the draft. And I mean, that's still possible. We'll uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, it's, it's, it's nice to see them fight. I don't have anything against Arthur Smith. I like Arthur, Arthur Smith. So if they win and keep him around, I'll be okay with that. Monica, who was the team for you growing up? Patriots. Patriots. Uh, but I'll, I'll add on the Dolphins. Know. Yeah, right, right. So welcome back to like the rest of like the NFL the reality. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, I will, I will add on the Dolphins. I don't know if you guys, if you guys saw this clip, but Andrew Hawkins on the Rich Eisen, the Rich Eisen show talking about Mike McDaniel. It's like a long clip. It's like eight minutes, but uh, I, I mean, I already thought like Mike McDaniel was a savant anyway, but I'm all in on that guy. Uh, and so I think by, by proxy, like Roberto, that makes me jumping in on the, the Dolphins bandwagon. No time like now, like he said. Um, yeah. Uh, Waddle and, and Tyreek, obviously with, with Tua, that's pretty fun. Man, what a, what a time for Monaco to, you know, see Brady win a bunch of titles. And then he's like, I'm neutral now in media. As soon as the <laughs> 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 become normal, he's like, I actually don't root for anybody. I have to keep it cool. Uh, yeah. Good job, Monaco. <laughs> Convenient yeah. timing. Yeah. You, you got the greatest comeback in, in, base, in baseball history with that Red Sox 2004 ALCS. And now you're like, ah. I'm, I'm like and team the greatest, affiliated. And the greatest Super Bowl comeback, too. Yeah. Oh, we oh man. I knew. <laughs> Ari, Ari was there <laughs> with Mike me. Knew Kurt was one. a Falcons fan. He's like, I can't wait to get the uh, fellas. <laughs> uh, Ari was there with me watching that one. We were at uh, Spirit, oh, right? Yeah. I remember. Yeah, we were at Spirit. And uh, I think I get, like, good sport fan cards for life for not, like, punching a wall in that restaurant. Like I was surprisingly <laughs> chill as that went down. Like I'm amazed I was how much I held it together. Him. I was trying to gaslight him the whole comeback. I'm like, <laughs> not looking good, Kurt. This is looking pretty bad, man. He you deserve like a medal of honor for, for not getting arrested. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I'm, I'm a, but you know, a Jags fan. So like not, not diehard, but I think like most Jags fans, no one's really a diehard. Um, but I don't know if, uh, I don't know if they're for real. They might be. They've got a good defense. Lawrence seems to have been taking a step forward, and um, certainly thirty-eight to ten over the Chargers is loud. No matter if mm-hmm. Herbert's kind of shaky or hurting or, or injured, or their their defense is a little injured, that's big to go to the West Coast and win uh, thirty-eight to ten anytime. So um, NFL should be a lot of fun. I think it's still too early to have favorites. It seems like a lot of teams are beating up on each other uh, early in the season, but. Um, wrapping up here because I think we're, we've we've gone about an hour and ten minutes or so now. Uh, Monica, where can they find you uh, on social media and, and what you got coming up on your slate? Uh, Mike Monaco underscore, unless I convince uh, the actual Mike Monaco on social media to 
to swap Twitter <laughs> handles and Instagram handles with me. Uh, an underscore at the end, M O N A C O. Uh, I'm on Red Sox duty this weekend, uh, filling in for Dave O'Brien up in Toronto, Red Sox at Blue Jays. Um, and then October will be college football. It'll be uh, NHL. It'll be a little NBA. So it'll be, that'll be a fun October bouncing around from sport to sport and then college basketball, hopefully plenty of the Knowles uh, starting in November. Good to be Mike Monaco. Appreciate you joining us here this week, man. And uh, you're welcome anytime to talk Link Jarrett. If you want to talk, <laughs> we're ready. Tal- Let's do it. Let's do it during baseball season. We will. We'll back on. 100%. All right, guys. Well, that's all the time we have. I uh, want to thank again Mike and Roberto for coming on. Kurt, as always, we're on Spotify. We're on Apple Pods. We're on YouTube and, and anywhere else that you like to stream your favorite pod. So until we talk to you again next week, Florida State plays Wake Forest, 3.30 on Saturday on ABC. For Mike, for Roberto, for Kurt, I'm Mario, and you've been listening to First and Noel.